Hello, everybody, and welcome. I have with me Dr. Catherine Page. And as you know, at the Center for Optimal Brain Integration, we like to elevate voice because we believe that voice matters. Giving people a voice that otherwise don't have one is critical to be trauma responsive and healing engaged. And Dr. Catherine Page today is going to talk to us about FASD, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. She has worked in a variety of mental health, child welfare, juvenile justice, and educational settings over the years, all leading to this current focus on FASD. She was the founder and clinical director of FASD Diagnostic Clinic in Santa Clara County Valley Medical Center, disabilities consultant for the Juvenile Drug Treatment Court and acting school psychologist for a large district in the East Bay. She is currently president of FASD NorCal, a parent professional collaborative aiming to raise California's ability to diagnose, serve, and prevent further generations affected by prenatal alcohol exposure. She has published journal articles on FASD for judicial and child welfare agencies and consults and teaches in California and Mexico. Her PhD is in clinical psychology with an emphasis on addiction and families. Her 38-year-old son, Evan, gives particular meaning to this work. And we are so looking forward, Catherine, to you giving us wisdom and voice to this topic. Would you like to add anything to your introduction? I'm thinking that I'm going to add a little piece that I don't always add. Um, but I have a feeling that I'm among friends with this audience of yours, Julie. Yep. Uh, and that is that uh, during my time directing the clinic, uh, the psychiatrist who was one of the founding uh, docs of the fetal alcohol movement um, helped me understand that my ADHD and poor balance and impulse control uh, issues and a bunch of other things were probably related to the photograph of my mom pregnant with me and a cocktail in the other hand. And so I am saying this out loud in order for you not to focus on that fact, but to acknowledge out loud, this is a spectrum. Yes. You can have a PhD and have fetal alcohol damage. It just, we'll talk about before we're done, some of the things that happen in the brain and some of the ways that we can shore up the holes in the brain that result from fetal alcohol damage. Wow. Thanks for inviting that little addendum. I'm so grateful for you sharing that. And I frequently share my own trauma history when I train to bring to light that there's hope. And so let's, with that, if it's okay with you, ask you the first question. I mean, many people who are listening now might not know what FASD is. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Yes, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders is everything that happens due to prenatal alcohol exposure of a fetus. And that is actually different for everybody, mm -hmm. little different for everybody, which makes this a confusing condition to really wrap your head around. But uh, a few core things that we can say, even though everybody is different. Um, first of all, 5% of this population has fetal alcohol damage. That's a conservative estimate it was based on a large study that had to exclude foster care. So at least 5% of us have fetal alcohol damage. Um, it ranges from uh, a little attention problems. In order to be diagnosed, it has to be to interfere with your work um, or your relationships or some part of living. So enough attention problems, um, executive functioning problems, reasoning, memory, judgment uh, are the core conditions that are affected. Otherwise, a person can be normal in every way. Okay. People sometimes think fetal alcohol is fetal alcohol syndrome, which really involves facial features, little eyes, 
flat, philtrum, thin upper lip. Less than 10%, fewer than 10% of people with fetal alcohol damage have the facial features. Most everybody looks totally normal, sounds normal, has an average IQ, but the ability to put the pieces together is uh, much harder for people with fetal alcohol damage. So um, I could I could keep going as you know, but I'll stop there for a second just to well, see what so comes So difficulty with executive functioning, in case people aren't familiar with that term, it's the thinking, the reasoning, problem solving, perspective taking. What else would you add to that? Uh, I think you pretty much got it. Yeah. But if you want to encapsulate it into one phrase, it would be getting the big picture. Getting the big picture is a great way to, to phrase that, executive yeah. functioning skills. Okay. And if there are people that are listening and they are thinking about, okay, FASD, less than 5%, you said, show physical attributes. Is that correct? Correct. Right. Then how would you screen or assess for this? Well, the first thing is, I mean, there's a couple of sort of... Um, hallmark pieces. One is appearance doesn't match reality. So you have somebody that seems to be, uh, you know, fully there, okay. but they lose jobs. This is, we're talking adults now, they lose jobs, they're in chaotic relationships with or without substances. Um, they are, uh, they make promises they don't keep, they can't manage time or money. When we're talking about kids, um, we're looking at um, what looks like kind of chronic disobedience, but isn't. Mm -hmm. It's not oppositionality, although it, is, it gets called that. It is simply not remembering, not grasping, um, getting distracted, um, having sensory issues that get in the way. I assume we'll have time to get to the part where we really walk through the specific areas that are glitchy. Uh, and there will be a handout that you could use for a reference screener. I know you're going to share with us a handout, with, with, which is a reference screener and maybe even four videos if people want to learn more information. Yeah. So we really look forward to learning more. And when we're assessing or screening, you are gonna provide us with a tool to look for these various signs. You said there's um, many children get misdiagnosed with what reactive attachment disorder or disorderly behaviors or non-compliance when it's just a failure to remember? Well, they get diagnosed with ODD. Oppositional defiance. More than that, ADHD. Okay. 90% of the kids we saw in the clinic had or qualified for a diagnosis of ADHD. It's the central cluster of, sy of symptoms. It is, okay. Yeah, yeah, but it's not a failure of, mem of memory alone. It's there are, in the wiring of the brain that enables a person to get a big picture, to remember what happened in the past, to connect it with consequences, to put yourself in other people's shoes, all of those connections seem to be a little uh, broken. Okay so that you can be good and functional in one area, uh, like, you know, art or music or uh, good sense of direction or something, but you are not able to make wise decisions. As a child, you're not able to make use of guidance of positive discipline um, consequences don't seem to matter. You keep making the same mistake over and over. Hmm. Uh, and that is one of the hallmarks of fetal alcohol is that there's this appearance of normalcy, but things are just not working right. So you take the child to the clinician who may diagnose any one of these ADHD, oppositional defiant, reactive attachment. Hmm. Or even trauma, even trauma. Oh, you bet. You bet. <sighs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if you were to just think about the intersection of trauma and FASD, you and I have talked in the past about how some kids, it's really FASD and not trauma. And I'm sure there's an intersection of both. I'm sure that children who have um, 
genetically FASD then experience trauma or naturally experience trauma within their homes. But some kids can get misdiagnosed if they have no trauma history and just FASD. Is that true? I don't think they would get misdiagnosed as, as having trauma if they didn't have a history of it. Well, if a child has FASD, many, many people come to me with, this child must have a trauma history. They're a child in my classroom. They have these particular behaviors. And then it's it ends up being FASD, but then how do they know? Well, the one, you know, when you talk about screening, it really starts with the one piece of information um, that is sometimes hard to get, but it's the essential one. Was there exposure? Okay. Asking that question is important to know. Oh, it's without knowing, you can't call it FASD. What does exposure mean? One glass of alcohol or persistent? Well, that, that is a question that's been debated far and wide. Okay. Um, Canada uh, and a new category in the DSM have just come up with cutoffs. Um, although the science is not, it, it's, it, it hasn't come up with any safe level, but these cutoffs are more than 13 drinks a month, more than um, two drinks a sitting. Okay. That that counts as alcohol enough for a diagnosis. Okay. Yep. Is there a vulnerable window of time? Like have they seen from the research the first three months and the last month doesn't matter or is it the whole pregnancy? first 11 days to two weeks, you have a grace period. Okay. Conception because um, what they call the conceptus has not attached yet. And it's not getting that alcohol. But after that little grace period, it's, you know, you're off and running. Uh, the first trimester is all about laying down the blueprint. And you have cells that, um, that can go wrong. Uh, three different ways at least. Um, I'm hesitating here. You can always edit this out if it's too long. Yeah. Right? But it's how I remember. No, this is great, Catherine. All right. Well, so a lot more information is coming in, but for a long time, they've known these three big mechanisms of when there's alcohol. The cells migrating out to where they're going to get to in the cortex, in the fetal mm -hmm. brain they act like little drunks on their way to a bar. That's my image here. One category, the drunk gets lost on the way to the bar. That's called impaired cell migration. They go to the wrong place. Wow. Second, impaired cell adhesion. They get to the bar and they fall off the stool. They don't stick to where they're supposed to go. Third, they drive into a concrete wall and they die. That's mm -hmm. apoptosis, which is a common thing that happens, but with alcohol, it happens way more. Cell death. Wow. So this really impacts you. So people who are listening should be very aware when they're working with families that um, alcohol is critical um, and it could impact the child long-term. And so we really need a lot of education around that. Absolutely. You know, what what a lot of us fail to remember sometimes is it not only impacts the child long-term, but in families that do have a lot of chaos and, and, and the ones where there are repeated child removals, chances are very good that the mom has fetal alcohol damage. Hmm. And so then hopefully at the end of this here, uh, what we're doing today, um, people will come out with the lens that they can put over their eyes, not only when they're looking at kids, but also the parents. If the parents have this goofy behavior, that everything looks normal, and they're making these promises that they mean completely sincerely to do things, to be places on time, to fill out paperwork, and then they don't do it. And then maybe they have goofy excuses about why they didn't, and or their lives are always in chaos crisis to crisis. You will do this family such a gigantic favor if you can ask, you know, I wonder, was your mom a drinker? Wow. Asking the adult, was your mom a drinker? Great way to start. Okay. What about when you were little? Any reason to think she didn't while she was pregnant? 
and you can start to sympathize with her then. You know, it looks like you have a hard time with like keeping paperwork straight. And, you know, sometimes that happens when a person's mom drank. This so is fascinating. Thank you. It actually tells me, listening to you, that this should be a screening question for every social worker, family engagement specialist, every program that um, accepts families into any program we serve, and even foster care. Um, Especially foster care. Wow. Canada is estimating 30 to 50 percent. Of their, of what? Care. Of their kids in foster care have fetal alcohol damage. So we, this topic is so important. And I, I want to give our audience a sense of hope if there is any, and I don't know that yet. And I know that when I train on trauma and the books that we've written on trauma, we have key strategies that can rewire and heal the brain that are um, healing, engage and resilient building strategies. I'll name a few. Attuned responsive relationships can rewire the brain to safety. Predictable safe environments can rewire the brain to safety. Teaching sensory emotional literacy, like awareness of your body and um, you know when your emotions or sensations are small, medium and large. And then finally self-regulation and being able to manage big emotions. But the reason we do the trauma strategies is because the brain and the body have been wired to feel unsafe. So rewiring it to feel safe so they can access the thinking brain that you talked about, the executive brain, is something that gives us all hope. I don't know anything about FASD, and I wonder if there are key strategies or if they're similar or if there's no research yet. What do you, what do you have to say about that? There's a ton of research, um, never enough. But the, one, the four that you just mentioned, the trauma strategies, are great for fetal alcohol. Um, one thing that, let me just tell you a bit of research, you and I may have talked about this, that predisposes our fetal alcohol kids to have a more intense reaction to traumatic situations. The research was, you know, everybody wants to diagnose newborns and it's really hard with fetal alcohol because you can't do the cognitive testing. Mm. Um, but they put electrodes on new newborns, exposed and not exposed did a loud noise or a flash, bright flash, checked the intensity of response and the duration of the response and how well uh, the learned, you know, what do you call it, habituation. Um, predictably enough, the alcohol exposed kids, very much stronger reaction, longer time coming down um, and did not learn. Every time was like brand new. So we have, we, and, you, the cortisol is higher in the fetal alcohol brain. Okay. Um, so we have a child that comes in. Oh, also, our research showing dopamine receptors are significantly, can be, statistically are significantly fewer with fetal alcohol damage. Which is a protective, it's a protective chemical, right? Yeah. Okay. That's the one that keeps us happy, that makes us happy, that makes us enjoy life. Mm. So the phrase was, some of these kids are born bored. So they never feel happy. They never feel a satisfaction. There's always this, I'm so bored, I'm not fulfilled. The sensation seeking, to switch mm -hmm. over to OG terms. Um, and so, yeah, you, um, so the four strategies that you mentioned are great for the fetal alcohol brain. Uh, one of the differences really is that um, it's, I think you were the one that shared with me about brain volume. Maybe. Yeah. Um, there is some, um, argument about whether, uh, the brain plasticity has actually also been impaired with prenatal alcohol. Oh, the ability for the brain to rewire. Correct. Oh, correct. Right. Um, although the piece of research that it may have been you shared with me was that the brain volume in the gray matter increased. I think it was after the alert program. So, What's the alert program? That's the, how does your engine run? Mm, it's a program that teaches. Yes. Yeah. I think that was the one. Yep. So, um, 
I think I've gotten a little bit uh, far away from what your question was. So, which is strategies, and 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 Catherine, at any point you can share um, any handouts or visuals you want to share with us. Um, I think just helping people understand that once they screen for this and they're recognizing some of the symptoms, how do they help? Can the holes be filled that you mentioned? Or is it more the adult learning how to cope through self-care? Um, what do you think? Actually, the, the worst thing that happens with a kid with fetal alcohol is that everybody's mad. Hmm. Everybody's mad at that child. The child is mad. The whole family is mad because they keep it looks like they're just disobeying all the time. And it looks like they're just having tantrums all the time. Um, and it can look from a perspective that isn't informed by brain awareness, that this is just a bad kid. Mm. And so everything changes. The most effective intervention is to at least try on the possibility that this is neurological that the meltdown is not a tantrum to get what they want, you know, strategized, manipulative. It is a little volcano erupts in the brain and there's nothing that kid can do about it. Now, that's a little black and white with the kinds of strategies that you guys bring in for trauma. Hmm. This probably can improve a lot. And that, bringing that nervous system, you know, jankiness down is the best thing. But, but really, the main intervention that works is helping everybody else get brain damage. Helping well, everybody, preventing it. Well, preventing it, but do you say preventing it? What did you say? Helping everybody get brain damage? No, helping everybody get that it is brain damage. Oh, I see. Rather than, you know, this is willful behavior that must be corrected. Yes. That's the main, I mean, the CDC strategy, best practice now coming through is about supporting families to really make that 180 degree switch because that's what it is. It's the strategies are not so hard. The attitude is hard. Mm, so it's renaming the behavior, redefining where it's coming from. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Is there any kind of medication? A lot of times they'll refer their child and they get diagnosed ODD or ADHD. Then they go on a medication. Do any of these help FASD? Well, yes, they help. They don't help with the thinking, which is screwy. The reasoning is screwy. It's a little bit like the reasoning of a drunk. You know, mm -hmm. sure, I can do it. Give me the keys. I can drive. I'll help you out with that here. Have a hundred bucks very gullible there, you know, so it doesn't help with that. Okay. What it does help with is the symptoms of ADHD. It helps with the symptoms of bipolar often. Um, it helps with the symptoms when you have severely affected kids who have rage, rage reactions that are mm -hmm. out of this world. A little Risperdal, a little Seroquel, everybody hates to use that. They have horrible side effects, but they make it possible for more healing and more relational work to happen. Okay. This is incredible. And what is it that you brought today that you wanted to share? Do you want to share your screen, some resources? That. Okay. Let's see. What should we do first here? We can look at this one. The, um, and listen, everybody, I believe this is thanks to Julie who sent this to me in the first place. And I hate to say, I don't know where I got this from, but let's take a look. It's from Bruce Perry. Oh, thank you, Bruce Perry. It's adapted from the Child Traumatic Stress Network. Yeah. Yep. There we go. Okay. So just to give everybody that sense of, um, you know, that there is this big overlap. And I must diverge again and say that where the trauma has been um, domestic violence, or neglect, um, and to the point that a child is removed or that CPS has become involved, um, there is so often alcohol involved in the family. And so often it's not one or the other, it is both. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of us who have adopted our kids at birth 
that do keep getting diagnosed with um, reactive attachment or with trauma, but we got them at birth, but they do have the same behaviors. So this is a, a good thing for our um, participants to go back and kind of soak in really. Um, I think rather than walking through it and reading these, what do you think? What, what's the best? I thing? think folks can actually read them themselves, but if you're just listening and this is an incredible visual, one circle is the word trauma with several types of behaviors that you might see with those impacted by trauma. And then in another circle, FASD and similar and, and, and unique um, symptoms or behaviors you might see, but then in the middle of the intersection between the two is a little space that is an intersection between FASD and trauma. So this visual might be helpful to you in your practice and understanding the intersection between trauma and FASD. So I think now that we're visually showing it, and even if someone's listening in, they can access this later visually. This is a great resource. That's great. I think it, it leaves out a couple things. One other of the hallmarks of fetal alcohol is uh, the person is a lot younger functionally than chronologically. It's very common. I mean, I was, when I got married at 28, I swear I was 13. Okay. I mean, I, I identify it with, you know, internally, even though I have a lot of strengths, there's still a, a delay. Yeah. Um, and when we have people with more severe, um, it is a spectrum, right? It's from pretty light to pretty heavy. Um, but there is over here on the fetal alcohol side of this beautiful Venn diagram, a space at the bottom where I would love to type in um, discrepancy between chronological age and functional age. You've got mm. operating at half their chronological age or a third or something, depending on the person. Yeah. That's um, a great addition. Okay, there is another one um, that I would like to share and that's this. Are we, are we here yet, do you think? Just to give people an idea and you can visual, you can verbally give people, paint the picture here. Um, but I'll say that this, this has been around forever, a good 20, 25 years. And it could use a little bit of editing. Some of you will point out a couple areas that you might like it to be different, but this gives you a at a glance picture of all of these other diagnoses going across the top, ADHD, sensory, autism, bipolar, attachment disorder, depression, ODD, trauma. I can't see what the last one is. Poverty. And all of this, there you go. And all of the symptoms that they share with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. All right. Um, now, so this is a good, it's a good reference. It's a great one pager. Anything else we want to say about that? No, but this is an incredible reference and we'll provide you the link or this handout um, when you get this video as well. So thank you for sharing this. This is not the screener. This is just a visual, right? Of the overlapping characteristics. Yeah. Got it. Let's see what happened to the other one. Where did, oh, here it is. The grid, where'd it go? There it is. Okay. Okay, now I'm, I, we would love to hear about this, fetal alcohol type symptoms. What is this? Well, this is something that I put together in response to um, a request from group home staff who, after they heard my talk 20 years ago, said, this is who you're describing is all of our kids in our group home. You know, could you, how do we tell the difference between regular, you know, juvenile delinquent teenager and, you know, and brain damage? So this is not hard science at all, but I did put it together and people do find it useful. Um, so we just walk through the various categories here and I will name them so that people that don't have the visual can hear it. And for those of you that don't see it, this is like on a scale of one to five. Uh, and the idea is here that if you have marked off, you know, let's say over half, although like I say, this is not hard science, mark off over half, uh, you know, at like a three or higher, 
you have some dysfunction in the brain. You don't just have, you know, deliberately um, disagreeable kid. Okay, so these areas are, um, the, the first one is ADHD type symptoms because that's the core of fetal alcohol. That and executive functioning are right there at the core of what's happening with the fetal alcohol brain. So you got, you got sometimes the hyperactivity, definite distractibility, definite impulse control issues. And that goes both ways. Often we think of impulse control as somebody thinks of doing something and they do it without putting on the brakes, but it's the other way too. You think of doing something that you should do and it's like, eh, I just can't make myself do it. That's another kind of impulse control. So there's, and there's this disorganization of, of stuff, of thought, of actually of sense of self, which is floating around, changing from day to day, hour by hour, which is one of the ways that you come up with a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder when you get older, because the identity does not hold still. Um, and no, I have not uh, gotten diagnosed borderline. But you're teaching us that there are many diagnoses that might intersect with this diagnosis. And pause by, actually, I'm going to interrupt you. Julie. Pause by. That uh, they, they not only intersect with, but they are caused by this brain dysfunction, this brain damage in combination with a society that doesn't recognize brain damage of this kind, but instead shames and blames it. Mm. So you get depressed, you get anxious, you get, you know, you, 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 you get more disorganized than even when you came in with. If everybody's pointing to you going, I know you can do this, you could do it yesterday, but you can't because your brain is just, you know, not holding still. So to keep walking through here, shall we? Yes. Okay. Uh, Sensory motor is very big. Just like with autism, we've got sensory integration issues, just like autism. Uh, very often um, too sensitive to lights, smells, sounds, touch, and taste, sometimes undersensitive as well, even in the same person. Um, you can be very easily overstimulated. Uh, took my kid to Costco one time and he he was 19 and I swear he was, this is a guy with a high IQ. Mm. Um, he, he kept like mad dogging oncoming customers, like looking at him like he wanted to pick a fight. Because internally he was very, very overstimulated. Just regulated by the stimulation. You bet. Did not have the filter. Mm. Okay, so, you know, typically we try to talk another person out of this reaction. We try to use executive brain strategies to talk them out of it and they can't access that. Bingo. Yeah. So the thing to do is leave. To leave. Okay. Not to shame, blame, criticize, or try to talk them into it, but to leave. Is there anything else you could have done with your son in the, in the middle of Costco? Could you have provided any other strategies that you thought of that might help him or is it best to leave? If we, if I had known what was going on, which I didn't until he was 16. Um, and then he was really beyond, beyond working with around this stuff. Cause he, we were, it was, anyway, if we had had a history of recognizing and working with the regulatory issues. At a young age. At a young age. Young uh, that's why early intervention and early diagnosis is critical. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so, you, so the sensory is one that it lends itself to easy identification. And uh, whether it's an adult or a child, you can put yourself in the position of ally very, very easily. If somebody's going, you know, they're just always like playing with the back of their neck, you go, do, do the tags on your shirts bother you? You know, and the person feels understood instead of the usual, can you just stop making everything a federal case? Can you just ignore some things, you know, okay. can you just get over it? 
So you can be their ally very easily using the sensory awareness doorway. Wow. Then you come to executive functioning, which is where it all falls apart. It's poor cause and effect reasoning. If I do this, that will happen. You know, and that's what all behavior modification is based on. You turn in your homework, you get the pizza. You get, you don't turn in your homework, you don't go to recess. They don't respond to those rewards. Exactly, or punishments. Okay. Do not work. Do not work. So what do you do instead? You just have to bring in the rails so that you're supporting success. Got it. So essentially the adult changes the environment to set it up for success more than doing rewards to change the behavior. This is incredibly insightful. That is, that is right there. You just got the crux of it. Got it. Yeah. So the executive functioning part, you can see that there's a list of six or seven things. Yeah. And then through, um, moving down, poor memory, different kinds, especially working memory. You know, we all have, what am I doing in the kitchen now? Um, well, big. You said working memory. And what I've learned from that is that we hold the memory of past situations so we can remember either the consequences or what to do next time. And they're having difficulty with that. Okay. That's right. That also helps impede attachment. Because if you'll remember, attachment requires that infant to be accruing layers of memory of this is the person who makes me comfortable. That doesn't stick. Okay. Plus you have a body that is not easily made comfortable. So it looks like attachment disorder and it is attachment disorder, but it's not reactive. Okay. Um, you've got my way or the highway, right? Um, it's the, are we there yet? Are the getting stuck on thoughts or a lot of perseveration? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? No, I know this is the right way. God, my son asked me, he was like 14. He said, what time is it? I said, it's three o'clock. He said, no, it isn't. That's and a sign. I, not knowing, I argued with him. We shouldn't do that. So speech is another one. Sometimes it's delayed, but usually not. Uh, expressive language is usually really pretty good. Receptive language is not. So we have a much better talker than a listener. And you did say earlier, they're, they're generally better at talking the talk, but not walking the walk. Oh, yeah. Got it. Okay. Yeah, which is, you know, that we all see that as a matter of character. And what is moral retardation? That, that word is uh, new to me. Well, it's, it, it's, it's what a, uh, an adoptive mom came up with. Um, not me, different one. And uh, this is in the presence of a kid with the average IQ, plenty of you know, working brain, but with a, some of us are guessing with a corpus callosum that is, impacted that is smaller, thinner, that the language side isn't connected with the action side. And so in the heat of the moment, did you do this thing? Did you take this cookie? No. Even though, you know, the cookie crumbs are leading right there to the, wow. you know, the crime. Um, so there's a, there's a lying, which we in the fetal alcohol world tend to call confabulation because um, it's not as pejorative. Lying sounds terrible and it feels terrible to get lied to. Stealing, there's no sense of personal boundaries. I'm gonna take this, um, gonna take this thing because I am gonna, I, I need it. And uh, no, nothing mean intended here. No ability to think it through, yep. Right, or consequences. Got it. Um, and rules, it's a funny thing about the rules because the sense of justice can be very powerful if it's I've broken one of the rules benefiting the other person. <laughs> um, but uh, it doesn't work the other way. Emotions, the, um, the electrodes on the newborns relate to this, easily triggered, often, in, often intense and negative. 
it has long been known that people with fetal alcohol are very at the edge of um, meltdown all the time, that crisis to crisis, emotional, like it takes very small things. And that the recognition of one's own feelings is not good. Mm -hmm. And so these are the teenagers that when you're working with them and you go, and how did that feel? And they go, uh, they're telling you the truth. Mm. They don't, I mean, it's, I hate that response. It's like, could you at least say it in words? Um, they don't know how they're feeling. And so early on, if I could go back and do it over again or teach, it would be early, early, um, early you know, with on the, with the, with the facial expression chart with the, you know, let's play games of give me your angry face of, you know, let's draw. Um, I would really try to increase that skill because that's the cornerstone, I think, of mental health, recognizing feelings. Um, the emotion of the moment, even if it's about a very small thing, is going to come and fill up the whole screen. And seems so big. And then at the very bottom, younger functioning is really... Um, it's all of these things combined add up to, you have somebody who is not developing at the same rate and may never reach, uh, you know, the kind of adulthood that we consider mature. Um, and w uh, Diane Malvin, who wrote probably the most loved book called um, Trying Differently, Not Harder, um, how she puts it is when all else fails, think young. So there you go. I am going to write down this quote because I think this is a perfect way to end. And I, um, my gosh, this short time has changed my life. I feel like just listening to you has first helped me think, my gosh, I've got to add this question to all, all, I think about all the clients I've ever seen in therapy and um, how I failed to ask this question. And this is going to change my life. I think it's going to change others. It's going to give a voice to this. And I'm going to end with this quote, try different, not harder. I think if once we uncover the possibility that this is a FASD, yes, at a young age, we want to do early intervention to support kids in learning how to develop self-regulatory and executive functioning skills. However, if we also create the environments for success, you said, then we'll have them have a higher chance of success rather than trying to change their behavior. And this is profound. Do you want to end with any words of wisdom before we close? You know, just this one little piece that simplification helps across the board whether it's a child's bedroom, take down all of those mobiles and posters and animals because it will be visually disor disorganizing. Simplify your sentences, your language. Simplify the instructions, simplify. Whatever you can, simplify. And that is like the overarching intervention. That's incredible advice. Dr. Catherine Page, I am in awe of you. I'm thankful that you would dedicate and volunteer your time to be with us today. And my one hope is that we can share this out, both you and I, with so many who need to learn this very important topic. Your wisdom has been profound and I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. I, I do wanna add one more little piece and that is that some of us are working on getting California um, to take on this issue as a state. Um, there, uh, so contact uh, you, right? Or do you want to put my contact information? Well, anywhere? what we're going to do is we're going to add to the write up that will go with this is all the websites, the resources, your links to all these handouts. We definitely want to link people up to as many resources as possible. So even though this is the verbal part of the interview, they're going to have a written piece that will go with it. Now, I do have a question for you. Would you be willing to start by sharing? verbally your website or even a way to contact you yeah it's uh fasd norcal fasd norcal.com org dot org good to know fasd norcal n-o-r-c-a-l dot org and Catherine, we'll provide your email and your links 
Um, and I'm so thankful. And I'm going to just say goodbye. And I can't wait to have you back in the future. Take care. Thank you.